Just a little bit about myself, just to begin. I started a company called Retro Tech in 2015. Uh, I, my passion is the CRT display. It could be a television or a monitor, but anything that has a tube in it, I really, I, it's, it's my passion and my expertise. Uh, I originally started working by the game consoles, started with the Atari 2600. That's really how I developed a skill for soldering, which is an important part of CRT upkeep and repair, is to have some proficiency in soldering and a little bit of technique. And I felt it, you know, I always recommend using something that, if you're going to get into repair, using something that's not as complicated as a CRT to get started with. But you can definitely achieve the goal of being able to work on one. And I do have a YouTube channel where uh, the the listings up there and then the other social media that I'm active on is Twitter. Those are the two most that I'm most active on. Uh, we have restored over 400 CRTs to date and I actively restore probably three to four on average every week now, depending on the different, you know, time and level and uh, need for repairs. But I, I, as I said, uh, my mission statement has for the company is resurrecting vintage technologies for the modern world. And the idea is for me, uh, when I was growing up, there was always a CRT involved when I'm playing a game, whether it was arcades or any type. For me, it was a lot of Nintendo, Atari, uh, anything from the early mid eighties and then early nineties. It was always on a CRT display. And uh, that was always part of the experience for me. So my goal has always been to try to keep as many of these things uh, actively able to be working uh, for, for both collectors and just to sometimes sell and things to make sure that uh, this format stays alive and so that people can enjoy it. Now, this presentation, I'm going to try to go through it very quickly so we can do some demo stuff with the things I've brought for show and tell a little bit. Now, we're going to go through the history of the CRT, different types of CRT, displays uh, current uses and benefits of the CRT, uh, what to look for when you're actually trying to get a CRT today, and then we're gonna, of course, look at why CRT repair and restoration is important, and then we'll be doing some demonstrations then, and I'll definitely save some time for questions in case anybody has any. I'd like to start with the history of the cathode ray tube. This is a technology that is very old. Uh, it's actually originally started in the mid-1850s, these two gentlemen were scientists that discovered in the mid-1850s Julius Plücker and Johann Wilhelm Hittorf. The, uh, they studied electrical currents and discovered that they could use a glass vacuum sealed tube to trap a cathode ray and project a shadow at one end of the tube. So it wasn't anything, uh, you know, not much of a display. This is just a tube that is vacuum sealed and again, they're passing energy through. That's the first thing. And then it takes a while till the late 19th century when you have a couple more scientists involved in a project. Um, Arthur Schuster uses electric fields to create deflection of the cathode rays. And then we have in 1897, William Crookes uses a magnetic field to deflect the cathode ray. And then in the same year, J.J. Thompson proves that cathode rays are made of subatomic particles known as electrons. So the electron was actually discovered using a uh, early cathode ray tube. And then fast forward that same year, a CRT is born. This is one of the first tubes that is called the uh, Braun tube. It's by a scientist called Ferdinand Braun. It's a cold tube, meaning there's no electrically hot energy going into it uh, to energize it. But again, it was something that would pass some kind of electrical beam and you could study it and try to manipulate the shadow it was casting and measure that electron uh, flow in that cathode ray. And then 1922, Western Electric sells a CRT. So this is the first official commercial CRT sold. Again, it would have been for testing or for, uh, you know, those the earliest ones would have been for like radar and uh, other just oscilloscope style tests. And it was sold as a commercial product. So nothing in the form of a television or anything like that. It, that wasn't started till later in the 20s. And 
Kenshiro Tagiyanagi unveils a CRT where he had put 40 lines of resolution, meaning he drew, he had the TV where it would have 40 lines of resolution and you could actually display a picture on those 40 lines. He improves it in a couple years to 100 lines. And then in 1928, he displays the first human face on a CRT screen. And that's uh, in later, four years later, RCA is granted a trademark. Uh, they basically use a lot of his work and his technology and they came out with the cathode ray tube term and they began making the first test units, black and white uh, television test units. And then they later released the cathode ray tube term to the public domain in the 1950s. Uh, that way other people could use that term for their displays. These are some of the trial sets. They're very bulky, a lot of tube hardware and a very tiny screen. If you look at the middle, I don't know how well you can see it up there. That's a cylinder screen where the uh, picture would have been actually displayed on and then it was reflected again off a mirror that you would pop up from uh, your furniture piece basically where it looked almost like a record player. So those are the earliest TVs. 1934, Telefunken sells a CRT TV set. This is the first commercially made television set and again produced in Germany by Telefunken. Here are pictures of the Telefunken television. So it's not like, <laughs> these were again, very large, lots of wood, and um, kind of like a centerpiece for a home, but most of them had very tiny screens. Now the early years of the CRT television, 1935 to 54, it's black and white CRT TVs become more and more popular though through that 20 year time period. RCA is the company that holds the majority of the stock of the market share at this time, over 50%. Uh, later in the late 40s, RCA develops a color CT, uh, excuse me, CRT television using a shadow mask technology, which I will talk about in a second. And then the late 50s television was be, originally being broadcast for the first time in color. And after those first early years, once the 60s hit, color TVs were the it thing and really started to skyrocket and take off. And that is a picture of the first RCA color TV set on the screen there. And then here's some other uh, late 50s designs of those very early color TVs. And the one thing I wanted to kind of notice is how it's, it's got that fishbowl side that was very popular and uh, a way of really dealing with the deflection of these early TVs. Some more TVs from the 60s now, getting a little bit more into that recognizable shape that you have seen more often, especially in the uh, one with the television pattern on it. Now, if we talk about the shadow mask technology a little bit, uh, this is an electron. If you, this is just a, a little uh, picture here of what is actually going on. So you've got the three primary colors there coming out of the electron gun. This is all happening with inside the tube itself. It comes through the electron gun. It hits this energized mask that's right behind the glass on the actual tube. And then that's how the colors are then presented on the screen. And if you could actually slow this down, it's, it's playing kind of a trick on our eye. It's drawing those lines at a higher refresh rate than our eyes can actually see. So it's literally just drawing single lines really quickly, but our eyes don't catch that. But that's the first uh, very good and stable technology uh, was to isolate those three beams, shoot them through that shadow mask and then hit the screen. And that's, that's why you have if you look really close at shadow mask or any TVs, you'll see the little phosphors if you look really, really closely. Here's, a, here's what that CRT gun would have looked like. Uh, again, this is inside the tube itself, right in there, and the neck board would connect to the back of that. There's some pictures of those and uh, what those look like on the tube. And then uh, shadow masks were produced for the entire lifespan of the CRT display. And you could tell a shadow mask tube mainly by the way the glass is curved. Now these Sony's are not shadow masks. They're a different technology, but they have a curve along a single axis where the shadow mask tubes tend to have curves both vertically and horizontally. So like this one, it curves all sides when you're looking at it from that angle. Now up to this point, Sony had not been in the game at all for CRTs. This is a 
not till the, the early 1960s, they wanted to get into the TV market. This is the first TV slash monitor they ever made. It was called the TV8-301. It was non-projection and all transistor television. It was uh, prone to failure. It was black and white, it was portable, and it looks kind of like, I don't know, like a fog light or something. Uh, it's a very cool and desirable you know, showpiece of history, but it was not a very good performing uh, t television or monitor. It was prone to failure. And so Sony really wanted to get into the color business, but they did not want to just go in and use the shadow mass technology. And it, the way they wanted to differentiate themselves was uh, in the early 60s, well, some of their executives were at a trade show in New York. They stumbled across a booth for a small company. The company was called Autometric. They had designed a thing called a Chromatron color CRT. And what they did, instead of having those three primary colors come through the electron gun on a shadow mask, they wanted to simplify the process and have it all come, all those three colors come through a single beam gun and shoot on a little slightly different uh, mask on the screen. It was similar in technology, but different. And Sony was really uh, enamored with this technology. They bought it out from Autometric and they took it back to their uh, labs and their studios and they tried to, and production facilities, and they tried to perfect this Chromatron TV set. In the late six, uh, in late 1964, Sony unveils the first Chromatron color TV set and, uh, and was sold originally at a huge loss for Sony. They were willing at this time to produce these things for all, and, and take basically over half the production costs and eat, eat it and lose it to try to get their technology out. And here are those early 1964 Chromatrons. They uh, do have their own style and really cool. Most of them are in museums at this point because they're very rare. And the reason being is Sony could not get the production costs down on these chromatrons. Something about it was just not working out. By 1966, this whole idea of getting in color TV nearly broke Sony and uh, lost them so much money that the entire executive team was told to either scrap the idea or go back and redesign the product. And so, Sony executives worked with 30 staff engineers, their brightest people they had on their team, and they uh, went and tried to redesign this chromatron tube and electron gun. And between 66 and 67, Sony engineers made major advancements in their designs, and they put so much effort into this one final try for a CRT, and it really paid off for them. They were able to figure out a way to make the electron emit a single beam and then uh, use this against electrically charged slots on an aperture grill, uh, which is all new designs, and just the combination really worked out and made a superior tube product for the time period. This is the 1968 KV-1310 color television. It is Sony's first major, again, uh, Trinitron color TV, and they had redesigned all the aspects, again, of the Chromatron and abandoned that technology, and the final CRT tube was finished and the final product was unique enough to apply for its own patent, which was very important. So the Trinitron was a patent uh, piece of technology at this point. Now, the new Sony tube was named the Trinitron from the root word Trinity, the forming the union of the three electrons into the single gun. So, and the Tron is taken from the word electron. So that's where they came up with the term Trinitron. Uh, now, this early design and, and even, you know, as they progressed and made this more efficient, it really outperformed the competition uh, at, at the entry level of this product. So it was way brighter. Uh, they had less adjustment after production, which was another thing Sony wanted to try to limit the amount of adjustment needed, which Shadow Mass needed a lot of adjustment post-production. Once they'd come off the floor, somebody would have to sit there and manually adjust these to get them to look pretty good and then send them off to sell. And then with this new Trinitron, Sony really dominated the uh, CRT market for the next 40 years until it ended. Um, and again, we talked about how the Sony Trinitron tubes are curved along one side. Now, of course, later on in the lifespan, a lot of TVs went to flat screen and monitors uh, that were still CRT tubes, but that wouldn't have been until after the year 2000. 
And it wasn't really until that patent expired all the way in 1996 that competitors started to make major advancements. You see, with the new Trinitron technology, Sony was able to, over that patented time period of 25 years, they were able to reduce their costs and uh, just really streamline production to where they could make this tube as competitively or as low cost as their competitors and they had a superior product. Um, and if you wanted to go and get a Trinitron in any uh, display that you had before 1996, you had to go to Sony to get a license for that. There were companies that did that. Apple Computers did that a lot in the early 90s. So you'll find a 1993 Apple computer screen and it will look a lot like this tube because it's literally a Trinitron tube inside, but they, it won't say Trinitron anywhere on the outside. Here's some of these 70s sets. We're really starting to get into that uh, gaming era now. These are the earliest RF TVs, color, some uh, 80s Trinitrons here where we're getting a little bit more stylistic still. It seems funny that they stayed with this wood design for almost 50 years. They had to have the wood on the TVs. But that's really the first television that I grew up on would have been very similar to these wood grain 80s models where you had to tune it into a channel three or four to to play games. Here's the 90s Trinitrons, which this one right here is from 1993, and it is a 13-inch uh, Trinitron. Uh, this would have been, you know, there's white and black is pretty much your two choices on the colors there. And then later on, this is the 2000s where we get into a lot of the uh, different size Trinitrons, really, ex you know, this is where they were trying to push the edge of technology between making flat screens, making perfect convergence, uh, they did come out with some amazing CRTs during this time period, right before the LCDs started to come out, uh, especially the one in the middle here, which is an FW900, which is one of the best CRT monitors ever made. It's a computer monitor. Now, let's get into some uses, obviously, for CRTs. I mean, a lot of you guys know, of course, the best uh, or most of the time you're going to have arcade cabinets have a CRT or, or hope to have them with the CRT if possible. Retro video games, all analog video game consoles are really good for a CRT use. VHS, DVD, laser disc, any kind of old school film buff uh, really does. I mean, for me, I like to watch those older films on CRTs, and it, it does make the uh, experience a little bit better for me, at least brings me back to that time period. Retro PC games, there are modern gaming on higher end CDs, CRTs like the FW900. You could still hook that up to a HDMI source and convert that to VGA pretty simply, and that monitor can still process modern gaming consoles. You can use it to stream older 4x3 aspect content and not have to deal with the black bars on the side that you'll have on your widescreen television. And of course, they're always gonna be used for test signals like oscilloscopes. Uh, oscilloscopes are a vital piece of technology still in use today, and a lot of those are using CRTs. Uh, for everything. Now, the reason CRT monitors and uh, displays are best for retro gaming are really the reasons that they have no lag or latency added it, into it. A lot of flat screens and modern televisions will have a game mode to try to limit any kind of screen latency. And if you use scalers, a lot of those are um, either not set up correctly or could be designed for a video signal, but not a high speed, uh, you know, pressing that you're trying to make Mario jump and you press the button and he takes a second to jump. Well, you're not going to see that on a CRT. You're going to get no added uh, milliseconds of response. It's all going to be super fast. You're going to get better spree screen picture controls a lot of the time for your colors and it's really quick, especially on something like this PVM down here with all the buttons and things on it. And I feel that retro games look better for nostalgic purposes on a tube, but there are some devices that are pushing the limits to get uh, a really good screen on your flat screen, almost as good as a CRT. CRTs are designed for analog video, and most consumer CRTs and pro video monitors, they display 240p and 480i video resolutions. So that's what all the analog video d really was. Uh, any of these old school video games were actually in 240p, whereas you think of like 1080p or 1440 or 4K now, this is way, way down there on the uh, early 240p. That's just 240 lines drawn in a progressive screen, so there's no flickering. The 480i is a flickering back and forth of those two lines. 
Now there are some pro end monitors and higher end CRTs that go from 240p all the way up to 1080i still, and then some that go even higher than that if you have a uh, computer monitor will go up to other uh, displays. Now, digital resolutions start at 480p and above and can be displayed on some CRT monitors. And new, nearly all flat screen TR TVs and monitors do not support 240p or 480i video resolutions, but if they do, they're incorrect. Most will not include uh, anything lower than HDMI input anymore. Now, some of the disadvantages to CRTs is, of course, they do have a high power consumption. I mean, even when this one's turned off, it can take about as much energy in standby mode as like a Wii while it's running. It's really amazing. But when it's running, it's, you know, it's way up there in the watts consumption. Uh, they are big and heavy, obviously. They do take up a large footprint wherever you're keeping them. They do have a relatively small maximum size display. Most of them won't go over 36 inches. They do have a 480i flicker where you watch it. Some people complain that they can see the flickering back and forth on that 480i display on say a DVD or uh, even early PlayStation 1 video games, early uh, disc-based games that are in 480i. And again, most can't display video that's in digital. And one of the biggest things is of course they can need repairs, cleaning, adjustment, and more because these were not intended to last you know, this is from 93. This is not intended to last 25 years or more when it was made. Let's talk about some things you should look for when you want to find a CRT. If you're looking for one or a second or a third, you know, the obvious things here, does it work? How does the screen look when it's turned on? You can go out and check out some of the CRTs that are set up and you'll notice some of them in the retro area might have varying levels of video quality and there could be different things affecting that from internal problems with the CRT to things with your signal. The screen size, what's the best one that's going to fit you? They go all the way down to five inches most of the time and up to 36. You want to uh, check out what the inputs on the TV has because there was a wide range of inputs on these and uh, we'll go through those in a little bit here. And what year was it made? It's, it's, that's an important thing to figure out. It, all these is, all these things are written on the back of the CRT. And then consumer CRT video inputs for retro gaming. So these are the inputs that you'll be looking for on the back of a TV. If you wanna get one, uh, you're gonna have RF available on really all uh, consumer sets. And that's obviously the lowest quality, but that's the coax input on the back of the television. Some will only have that. Uh, later on in the, or the late and mid 80s, they would have added composite video and it was really a standard by the 90s to have composite video. That's your yellow single input and then most of the time they had mono audio and some would have stereo. S-Video was a really big leap here in America for video quality and it was implemented in the mid to late 90s. That is the black connector. Uh, it, right above in the middle, that picture, it's got that um, black ring around it. That's a really good input. And then a lot of them towards the end of the life of the CRT would add component and it was called color stream. So if you see a TV and it says color stream on it and not component, it's still component video. It's just really early component. And that separates each one of the colors. So what happens is on RF, the reason the signal is so bad is you've got all these different uh, signals coming through one cable. You got both audio and video, and then composite broke it out where it's just all your video plus your sync. S-Video broke it down where it was two portions of video, and then component broke it down to where you're separating all three primary colors, and that was a way to separate the colors and just have more data sent through those lines and produce a better picture. And here's some of the best brands of consumer grade CRTs. Of course, there's the Sony Trinitron from the years 96 to 2005. Those would be the best ones. You can still find good earlier ones, but if you go earlier than 96, you're gonna run into uh, not as many inputs. You're not gonna have S-Video. Sometimes you'll need 90, you just have composite. Now the best shadow mask CRTs would be a Toshiba and a JVCD series. Those are pretty much two of the very best. This A series, was Toshiba's arguably best CRT they ever made, and it's really good. Um, and then this D-Series is still highly sought after 
collectible actually television there's one out there with uh, some golden eye n64 running on it it looks really cool and what about the best crts ever made that's one of these down here at the end these are the uh pro editions of the crts and that's a crt commercial grade monitor from the 80s up until the mid 2000s these were produced these are professional video monitors were developed for three major industries the medical field film and TV production, and in industries that had uh, security, where they would have closed caption television for security purposes. These pro CRTs often cost 10 times the price of a consumer television, and they pro-level monitors provided superior, superior picture performance, and they're completely adjustable, and they're really unrivaled for the screen quality. And they, you know that's why if you see an old movie from the 80s and they go to a news room and it's got just walls of these cube style monitors. That's because those were all in use again in a commercial environment. Uh, these monitors can offer the same inputs as the best consumer CRTs. And a lot of them have additional inputs for things like RGBS, which RGBS and component video are the highest quality analog video signals you can use. Um, RGBS is kind of what goes straight into the arcade monitors. And that's why it just gives you a little bit color or a little bit more uh, color clarity most of the time. They also support multiple formats from different regions. So if you have PAL consoles and want to mess around with anything outside of the United States, you can use these monitors no problem. And they also have NTSC support that most of them do not have RF at all. And what Pro CRTs do, and you can when we get done with the uh, talk here, you can come up and look at the TVs. You can tell a difference if you look really close at them, where you'll be able to see a scan line where you can tell the 240p is on there, where you see a dark scan line. Uh, so you get that natural scan line effect on the pro monitors. You can also get it too on consumer sets, but it's not as noticeable. Now the Sony PVM and BVM were Sony's, you know, commercial grade monitors um, and Sony produced this professional monitor uh, again for medical security and professional video editors used them a lot the one down here is a medical monitor and then Sony also outsourced like I said some of this to other companies and licensed their product and they actually made an Olympus uh, like the camera lens Olympus and to microscopes they, they would use Sony monitors and they would just put their own name, Olympus, on it. Uh, Sony also produced the BVM, which I don't have one here today, but that is the highest quality there is. It's a broadcast video monitor. And these were extremely expensive uh, in the 10,000 and up range when they were bought new. Uh, most of them were a max of about 20 inches in size for screen, but they did go up to bigger than that. And they are uh, going to offer some of the highest video resolution where others, normal TVs might have like three to 400 lines of TV resolution. The PVMs kick it up to 600 lines of resolution. And that's how you get that sharper image. And then if you go to something like these BVMs, they were 800 lines to 1,000 in resolution. So there's just some different BVMs, what they look like. They're very heavy, very heavy duty, pretty much all metal for the most part. Uh, Shadow Mask CRTs did have pro versions. They had different brands making them. JVC, Panasonic, Ikigami, and of course NEC. The one you see pictured with Sonic is a JVC. And then there's a Panasonic version of one, an Ikigami version of one. And, excuse me, the uh, XM29 is a very desirable huge screen monitor, almost 30 inches. And that's made by NEC. Now, multi-format Pro CRTs, these are the best and most desirable Pro CRTs uh, and most expensive because they support video signals all the way down from 240p on your retro consoles all the way up to 1080i just naturally through component. So you can still run uh, anything that you can get downscaled to 1080i or 720p on the multi-format monitors. They did make them in a widescreen. They also tend to have higher resolutions, some of the highest, the 1,000 lines. So it's got a very sharp picture that you won't see on most other CRTs. And the build quality was, again, really, really high, 
high quality. Now these monitors did require routine maintenance. Sony had people on staff that would go out yearly to video studios and they would service and check and QC uh, calibrate these monitors every year. And here's some of these pro uh, broadcast and high-end monitors and these are just huge and these like this one is a 24 inch the one below it is a 32 inch and these can't even be lifted by one person most of the time you know, these are ones that almost have to have a forklift they weigh hundreds of pounds the 20l5 is a 20 inch it's much more manageable but it's still a 60 to 70 pound monitor and these are the best of the best and examples of one that can go all the way from that low uh, retro gaming up to, you know, way later in generation where you're up to 1080i. Shadow mass multi-format CRTs, there is an Ikigami HTM series. So if you run across that one, it is very special. And it's one of the only ones uh, that Ikigami made that does also do, each one of these had secret, you know, these ones are some JVCs too. These are all ones that could go from 240p up to 1080i. And the reason I really show these is because if you're lucky enough to find these, they are less common, but they don't tend to sell for much as, or be sold for as high a price as the Sony's because the Sony's right now, those BVMs, if they're in working condition, can go for a really, really lot of money on uh, forums. And this is the top PC CRT. And I said again for modern gaming that GDM series FW900, it has a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. And there's the native resolution, it's pretty high. Um, and it's gonna have a really high refresh rate, highly sought after uh, for PC use uh, for anything really. It's, it's a great monitor. Um, but again, these are very hard to come by. Best places to find CRTs is to first check with your family and friends. I know that like when I would go, I, I know my grandma, I'm sure she still has some that she uh, has in her house, there's always, you know, half, half the households in America still have at least one CRT in them, uh, statistically. Look at online marketplaces, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, Facebook Marketplace, you can really find a lot on there. Just put an old, old TV, CRT TV. And if you're just looking for something to get started with, you can find those for less than 50 bucks most of the time, locally. And major online retailers like eBay is gonna be a good place to find, obviously, the rarer CRTs, but you're gonna be paying a lot more usually on eBay and you're gonna to have to deal with shipping most of the time. Local government auction websites, there are still those around, so Google and see if there's any of those near you where you live. And they sometimes get CRTs from libraries, from schools, from other things um, that were using these uh, monitors, even pro monitors I found on government auctions. And you can still go sometimes to local CR or local TV news broadcast stations. And a lot of times they'll have a basement where they just stack their old equipment. And sometimes you get lucky and you might find um, uh, more CRTs than you can imagine from a local news station. But that does take some uh, footwork. Now, I'd like to just briefly go over CRT repair and <laughs> restoration and why it's important. The two pictures on the screen, I don't know how clearly you can see them, but this is the most common problem for CRTs now is this particular component, the electrolytic capacitor within a circuit board of the CRTs. And this is an actual circuit board from a PVM. It's the one that's inside of these PVMs down here. It's a power supply, and it's got all different sizes of these electrolytic capacitors, but these things were made the time the CRT was manufactured and they have a shelf life in them of ten, it's supposed to be about 15 to 20 years. And so we're passing that. Now it's not saying that all of them are bad right away. There are ways to test and find out and diagnose which ones are bad uh, because especially nowadays with the way parts are, it can be difficult even to source something as silly as a capacitor and uh, the right capacitor. So you, you know, modern capacitors might not be better than the ones that are already in there However, that is the most common thing is, is dirt and then capacitor failure on CRTs. All right, so I wanted to go through here and do a quick demonstration. I did talk about this software. It's running on the screens right now. And it is called the 240p test suite. So um, let me get up here and grab this. And this,
show you the software. We'll, we'll roll through it. Um, now this is a homebrew calibration software, and this is a place where you can get more research on it, this website. This is an amazing piece of hardware, or software, I'm sorry. And the ROM is downloadable, and it can be played on almost any kind of retro console. It's really designed to be used through a retro console into a display, and then it helps show you things. And what I'd like to show you is the software. I'll be pulling it up here on the left. And I'd just like to give you some of these test patterns because these kind of test patterns are what I use uh, to not only check the screen quality. Some of you, have, if you've messed with arcade machines, you might recognize this crosshatch pattern. Uh, this will help you check your screen geometry, see where you're at as far as your overscan. Uh, there's also uh, like a lot of things for color. You can check and see all your colors are going there. And then there's many modes to this. I just wanted to give a little bit of a demonstration. Now, this one is a monoscope pattern, and it looks a little crazy, but it is a brand new pattern that came out within the last five months, and it can show you a whole lot. So first off, if I can, I'm pressing this to dim the screen, and if you ever work on a CRT, you know that uh, you can, that can be really helpful to get that screen brightness lowered to the lowest point possible because that's how you can, you can adjust internally your sharpness and you can really line up your focus like this. Now, if you see the red screens or the red lines on the screen, that actually shows aspect ratio. So something that is important for CRT is to be displaying the proper aspect ratio of your game so that your characters don't look fat and squashed or thin and long. And the actual cool thing about this pattern is those squares, if, they're, if each side of those squares matches, uh, the same length on each side matches, you have perfect four by three linear uh, aspect ratio. So you can just take a measuring device and measure those and adjust it till those match and then you'll have a perfect aspect ratio it also helps you get rid of a lot of screen wonkiness by using this with some adjustments. And uh, there's other just really great patterns. And what you saw when you, come in, when you came in was a scroll pattern. And that is used to determine what your screen looks like when it scrolls across like that. If you have an issue with screen tearing, you can see that really simply with this. And there's even a different mode where you can do a vertical and horizontal scroll and you can speed that up with the controller like this. Um, and I know that this is, this again is just something that's really helpful if you just want to check the integrity of a screen. If you're going to look at a TV, maybe you don't even want to adjust it, but if you go and find one, you can take a little console like that I've got right here, get, um, download this ROM. If you have a way to load the ROM, and hook it up to a composite video, you can test out the CRT before you take it uh, and, and really check the screen and see what, uh, what condition it's in, see if it's good enough to work on. I uh, know one of the important things is with CRTs I like to talk about is e-waste uh, because that's what happens most of the time with CRTs is they end up in e-waste places. In 2006, the EPA designated CRTs that were marked for disposal. They were considered hazardous waste. Uh, and that's due to the lead and other phosphor uh, hazardous materials in the glass itself. And they encourage recycling or reuse. Uh, there is disposal regulations for your state, so it could be different depending on how much they want to deal with it. But the problem with a CRT tube is there's so much hazardous stuff in it. I was drinking a, my water bottle, and this was uh, something I thought that was kind of interesting. On the water bottle, it says this water bottle can be turned into a pair of jeans, which is pretty crazy. But you can't, <laughs> you can't turn this lead glass into much of anything. It's too dangerous. If you think about it, you can never make anything that somebody's going to drink out of. The only real thing that was ever used that was kind of good was it was broken up and used in concrete mixes. But again, adding glass to concrete and lead, it's chemistry, and that can all cause its own issues. So there's still not a really good cost-effective way to just dispose of the CRTs. That's why if you do end up at a place that says they recycle CRTs, a lot of them end up looking like this, 
where they're like, yeah, we, we take CRTs and they really just pile them up somewhere, pile them up. And the guy actually that's in the picture that's hard to see on the right, this is just to show you, it's so labor intensive just to tear down a CRT to get all the good components out because boards like this can be broken down to its lowest component and almost all of it be recycled and plastic and things like this. This is a deflection yoke from inside a CRT. There are so much good, clean copper in here that this is worth recycling. However, the tube itself is so big, bulky, dangerous, hard to dispose of that it, it's, it's more costly to deal with than the benefit of just breaking it down. It just costs too much. And unfortunately, most CRTs end up in landfills and they end up shipped overseas uh, because they just end up in these contracted, you know, different countries where they're scrapped and places like this where the, you can see CRTs all around here where they're just scrapped out by kids uh, doing, you know, poor thing. It's just a terrible place for your CRT to end up is in something like this when you thought you were getting it recycled. But the good news is there are still plenty of great CRTs out there. They've not all gone away. And like I said, the best thing we can do is try to reuse them or find a good home for them. Um, and every retro gamer should have at least one or maybe more. Uh, but that's, I just breezed through the presentation as quickly as possible there. So I could uh, go through and show you guys just some of the things real quickly I brought with me. Um, first off, this is a eight inch Sony Trinitron tube from a professional video monitor. And I like to bring this in. So if anybody wants to come up here, definitely could take a look, but it has um, everything compacted in here, even the anode cap. And uh, that is, you know, if you just like a second on safety, this is the thing everybody's concerned with on safety is this anode cap. Uh, I'm really not set up to do any discharge or anything today, but this one can't be done. It's solid. But that's one item. I've got a CRT tester down here that's set up. It doesn't, you don't probably want to hook it up. I don't know what it'll do. It's from the 60s. It doesn't really work. It's just more of a novelty thing. And it, but it would be used to hook up to a tube from like the 1950s or 1960s. And it could analyze the tube itself, the quality, whether it was working, how much life was left on it, uh, how much, you could even use that to recharge colors. Um, which I'm sure that if, if you've been working on arcade monitors, you may have used something like that. Uh, different. Again, this is a power supply. It's a circuit board from the 1990s. So you could tell uh, a lot of bigger components, a lot of space on these boards, which just is, it's good because that means that these are, when you know how to work on these, they're very serviceable. Uh, but the biggest issue with most of these things is, again, the capacitors, also dirt. Dirt just builds up inside these things because they've never been open. This is a bezel, which would have been on the front of this monitor. And then finally, I have the deflection yoke, which this goes on the back of the tube right in this area. And this is the way that your circuit board controls all your screen deflection where you actually your geometry and your picture it's actually coming from the magnetism generated by this copper coil and uh so that's uh the presentation i wanted to see you know if you guys have any questions or feedback or anything um, i know that was kind of quick but um if you guys have any questions i'll be glad to glad to answer it Is there a, uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, so something like where he says he has a bigger TV and it will get fuzzy and then knocking on the side of it might clear it up. So that's uh, the first thing I would check out is like the signal just and I'm not you make sure that uh, whatever you're using is good connected in there and it's not um, either wiggly or that you go back there and sometimes on the input board tell if your input is solid by just wiggling it around. Sometimes those will break free. Because another thing that happens is the solder that holds these components in place just degrades over time. And uh, depending on the conditioning, 
of the board and the condition it was kept in that solder can break down too and that can cause where you know if you hit it it might go back and actually be making contact but sometimes it might something might come loose so um, basically i would say first check out you know the outside to make sure that the signal is still clean coming in and it's not like just hitting that isn't affecting your rf or your uh, composite video or something but if it's if it's on like different inputs always then it's probably where there's a cold solder joint possibly in the tv somewhere on one of the boards yes sir to replace the actual electron gun no that uh, i've seen i've seen videos and there is some cool there are some cool videos on youtube where um i don't know when it was but somebody did set up a machine to basically what they did was they cut this glass right here and they pulled the electron gun out and then they'd put a new electron gun in and then they'd blow the glass with a torch but that takes an insane skill set that literally i don't know um, I don't know that if there, if there's anybody, you know, consistently would have a good enough skill set, because then you got to vacuum seal it. It's just crazy uh, the amount of work to get in. And that's you know, the, the other reason I get asked questions of, will we ever see CRTs remade? And I tend to think not. Um, and the biggest reason is the environmental impact of these things right now, and. Uh, just the fact that there was an extreme art it took to actually make these these tubes and everything actually work. You could see how much back in the day Sony was willing to take losses and almost go bankrupt to try to make one. But now you're literally going back and you'd have to redo all that because most of that information is probably gone. All the tooling made this stuff is destroyed. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's just an insane process. It's like, no, and unfortunately, I did have one break where I could actually, I couldn't find it, where the, I could pull the gun out and it's a long metal piece. Looks like the thing that they dropped in Neo's belly button in the Matrix, part one, the bug. So, yes, sir. No, I don't sell them uh, here usually. Sometimes I've had a booth. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody's selling them. I'm not sure, but I don't. Um, most, most of my work, I get uh, people bring, collectors will bring in their CRTs. Most of the time they're the professional ones like this one or higher end, like the ones we sh I showed on the slideshow. Uh, they are the ones that I get brought to me to service, tune up, check out. And some are just flat done and then you got to diagnose what's wrong with them and try to get them to power back on uh, but the the biggest obstacle there's well there's two obstacles kind of is finding them and then uh shipping is a, is an absolute nightmare i've had uh, I, I mean this one here is a monitor that i bought in the last couple of weeks off of ebay and it somehow survived shipping uh, but it was shipped literally in a box, just a box with like one bubble wrap around it, sitting on its backside, which is plastic. And then I had another, you know, and it survived. But then I'd have another one that was packed and double boxed with foam and really packed well. And it's somebody kicked it off the truck or something or it just fell off a conveyor belt and it's been pretty much demolished. Uh, so like the, the good thing is, is just try to... Uh, you could save a lot of money, time, and headache if you can find something locally. Plus, usually you can test it out before you, before you actually buy it. Any other questions? Well, thanks again. I appreciate your time. If you have any other questions, uh, please let me know. I'll be around. Uh, these are, again, my two main uh, contacts, and I... Um, and that's pretty much it. Thanks.